Welcome to the very final lecture in this year's Evan series. And that means that I get to give a round of thank yous to all those people that made the series happen. Uh, and that includes the Alaska Fisheries Science Center and Northwest Fisheries Science Center, as well as the <coughs> Donald E. Bevan Endowed Fund in Fisheries for sponsorship of the program, without which we wouldn't have any speakers. Well, that would all be from within the department, which would be much less boring, much more boring than, than, than it is. Um, <laughs> I should give a big thank you to the group of students that make up TGIT, which is run by Daniel Peterson. And they're the ones that organize the, importantly, the keg and the wine and the, the snacks afterwards for the light reception. And also uh, Marcus Duke, uh, who runs the website and does a whole variety of other administrative things in the background. And it's a rather sad note because he's heading out to Seagrad and we're going to lose him in this department. And we're not quite sure how to replace that for what he does in the Bevan series. I have to run the websites, they won't exist next year. <laughs> but also Kathy Schwartz for organizing the posters. She always does an excellent job every year, as you can see from the array of posters outside from each of the previous Bevan series. And finally, of course, Sherry Wagner, who I only half jokingly describe as actually running the series, because she does all of the logistic arrangements picking up and dropping off the speakers, um, running the websites for the undergraduate and graduate course, courses, doing all the administrative details, and virtually everything else. All I do is show up here at about 4.20 and introduce the person introducing the speaker. So thank you very much to Sherry. Perhaps we can give a round of applause. Biggest, most important contributions of that 
Um, and that was interesting, not only what they said, but also people's responses to that. It was, it was sort of like asking people, you know, what's your favorite Beatles song? <laughs> You're like, I can't pick one? Wrong <laughs> brain. Um, so I got all these long, lengthy emails. Um, I was also hoping to get some really good stories, but I didn't really get any stories. Um, but the one thing that really uh, popped up that everyone really mentioned was um, but really head and shoulders uh, uh, sort of game changer was his work on active adaptive management um, in the Northwest Australian Shell. So hopefully we'll hear a bit of that today. Um, also, I should mention the Japan Prize uh, also pointed to that directly. I thought I would just share some of the, the text that was in that. Um, uh, Dr. Keith Sainsbury established for the first time the importance of seabed habitats and determined what it would be a key species and the species composition of the Australian Northwest Shelf ecosystem. His research approach involved the first practical application of experimental or actively adaptive management of fisheries for sustainable exploitation of fishery resources. And the impacts of this work have been widespread, resulting in restricted zoning and human calling in several areas of Australia. So not only is he sort of pioneering the science, but it's directly feeding into management. I thought I'd close with the last uh, sentence that was in the, the statement for his Japan Prize. Um, from both academic and applied research points of view, he's an outstanding leader in fishery science who contributes greatly to improve management of fisheries. For this, he deserves to be awarded. And I can think of no better award than giving the last seven sentences. <laughs> <laughs> well, so join me in welcoming Keith. Well, thank you very much, Tim, and I must say my first reaction to all of that is to uh, close up and go home, because can only go downhill from here. <laughs> so, uh, that's all going. Uh, so, yeah, uh, look, I, I, I do have a bit of a strange uh, background. Um, so I was initially trained in, in content of um, uh, a, a joint, joint uh, major in maths and technology, and so I started off doing a lot of um, software systems work and general modelling. Uh, as time has gone by, I've got more and more involved in the management side and, and ultimately my sin is now um, uh, a commissioner within the Australian Fisheries Commission, which I'll explain a little bit about before. So uh, I, I, I do aim at this as a friend in terms of the science and the policy management side, so I'll try and cover a bit of both and, uh, uh, and hopefully reason. So what I'll do is, uh, I'll, I'll, and you're not going to hear anything about the shop, <laughs> but uh, I was asked to go through what it is that Australia is um, doing in, uh, over the last uh, uh, eight to ten years or so in terms of uh, introducing ecosystem-based approaches to fisheries management in Australia. Uh, so what I thought I'd do is I'd, I'd very quickly, first of all, go through the reasons for the journey and why, why we bothered and had some objective to this. Uh, then I'll give you some of the policy and bits of uh, the background that we've been working in. Uh, and some of that's been quite crucial as to what, what's been uh, then I'll go through what some of our implementation has actually involved, how we've, how we've done it, and I'll end up with some comments and some conclusions. But, the, but in a very broad sense, the reasons for the journey, and, and Australia is you know, not, not unlike elsewhere, uh, we have really increased our use of the ocean and coast quite markedly in the last few years. Uh, the size of the number of ships, that's a, that's a really big uh, issue, not often talked about, but the number of, of introduced species that have come in with these ships in Australia now is, is really quite huge. Uh, some of our biggest abandons, the, the 10 most abundant species in the marine system are introduced, are introduced with some really major impacts. Uh, fishing more species, more places with better technology, and we all know about that. That happens to be a photo of an orange rock you catch in the middle of the Indian Ocean, about two kilometers down, so there aren't all that many places uh, that aren't being hit. Uh, coastal development. Massive changes uh, in Australia as elsewhere. Coastal agriculture, that's that didn't even exist uh, really as an industry in Australia 10, 15 years ago. Uh, it's now widespread. Uh, a lot of introduced species come in with that, a lot of coastal zone impacts come in with that. Um, oil and gas, marine oil and gas, again a brand new industry, and then of course, of course the whole lot of that is the, uh, the, the climate change. Now, specifically within Australian fisheries, what was the problem? Uh, looking back in 2004, and as I say, I'm really focusing on what we've done in the last about 8 to 10 years. Uh, this was the situation with Australian fishery management fisheries. Uh, we were accumulating overfish target stocks. Uh, we had a lot of uh, what we think called data poor fisheries, that basically unassessed fisheries. About 50% of our stocks were in that status. And then we had this really nasty repeating pattern of things jumping straight from the uncertain into the unfished. 
uh, with, uh, with, with no stock along the way. And we're having a similar problem with a lot of the bycatch species that, that uh, of the several thousand that are out there, uh, all of a sudden, some, for some reason, we've become aware of a problem with, uh, with, with one of them, and then uh, all manner of uh, other government processes, you know, listing processes, etc., would come with that. And probably more, more of a concern uh, that they just undermine public confidence in, uh, in, in whole management arrangements. Left the question of, you know, is this ecological? It went a bit further than that. Um, again, back in 2004, we were having deteriorating economic performance. There were a whole not bunch of reasons around this, but um, just looking here at the number of vessels and a few of our larger fisheries, and then even a net economic return, uh, you can see that some of those are negative, some of them are barely positive. Uh, I should, should say that the net economic return is the total, total work news minus total captures. It's, it includes a, um, the opportunity costs for land or something with fewer to zero for that the whole fishery you'd be earning about what you might expect to earn from that capital that was used uh, elsewhere. Uh, but anyway, the, by and large we had a lot of unprofitable fisheries at the enterprise level, causing aging fleets, aging workforce, uh, inadequate maintenance, some operational inefficiencies, uh, an incentive to cheat, and skill shortages and some social problems. Which I but all in all, that was leading to, to, at the same time, a real concern about the ecological sustainability of the ocean. So uh, the overall response was maybe these ecosystem-based approaches would, would actually help, uh, help uh, provide a solution. So the ecosystem-based approaches have this collection of attributes, which I won't read you through, but uh, they're the sort of things that, that people were, were, were seeking. And our real problem then was, uh, well, how to actually implement that kind of, of operation. Uh, but before I do go into how we did that, uh, I'll, I'll just go back, backwards a bit now and then just step through some of the policy and legislative environment that, that we're working uh, in Australia. So the first thing to bear in mind is that uh, Australia is a, a, very, a very recent nation. Uh, basically, it only federated in, 2000, in uh, 1901. Up until that point, it was, it was five separate countries and their own, their own show. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, um, then it was discovered in, in the, in the uh, late 60s that uh, through accidents of the way that the Constitution was put together, the states had no jurisdiction below the high water mark, uh, even though they had been actually jurisdiction in the way all that time. Um, the uh, the uh, result of that was a, a, an offshore constitutional settlement which, which attempted to try and put things back as people had expected them to be. Uh, with the three mile um, jurisdiction for the states. But in the process, it uh, ended up being a negotiated outcome, and we have quite a, uh, a range of, of uh, structures in that offshore constitutional settlement that gives uh, state jurisdiction for some species up to 200 miles, federal jurisdiction for others right into the coast, uh, and an interesting mix of gear types and, uh, uh, and, uh, and, and, and other, other things in that. So, in other words, you a slightly messy uh, jurisdiction. The other thing uh, about Australia is it's got a lot of involvement with international map. Uh, it's got uh, the Convention for the Antarctic Marine Living Resources across the south. We've got um, a couple of our major fisheries uh, uh, through here, Quarry Island, and over here at the Big Island, uh, that are actually uh, in or adjacent very close to the Camelot Convention area, and so there's a need to to harmonise the management there with what goes on in the Camilla. And then we've got a collection of tuna uh, RFOs, the uh, Regional Fisheries Management Organisation, the Southern Blue Tuna for the uh, Indian Ocean and the Western Pacific. And then across that, uh, we've also got this newly forming uh, Regional Fisheries Management Organisation for the South Pacific, which basically has non tuna jurisdiction for uh, this whole region. We have bilateral arrangements with New Zealand, with France, with Indonesia, and the AG. France has got uh, the other part of the Cook Island Cafeau here, and also New uh, Caledonia. So there's that complexity. Uh, in terms of the fisheries themselves, they obviously go from the tropics to the, uh, to the uh, subantarctic, they have quite a wide range of uh, species. But they're all, um, actually, you would almost say, pathetically small. Um, if you add them all up, as, as I've done there, you, know, you, hardly, you hardly muster a decent-sized fishery out of the lot. Um, 
uh, by global standards, and yet we've got lots of them. Uh, so that's part of our, of our difficulty of uh, uh, dead poor fisheries. Uh, lots of small to medium sized fisheries. Now they're all managed by the, uh, and the, the Australian Fisheries Management Authority, which is actually a commission that I'm a commissioner of, as I mentioned. The history of that is uh, it's a, it's a, it's a, a structure that's, that's not used here in the US. Basically, uh, the, the National Authority was set up by two pieces of legislation uh, in, in 1991. It's a statutory body, statutory authority. Uh, it's, uh, the, the legislation determines a lot of its uh, composition and its uh, objectives. Uh, its objectives include ecologically sustainable development. Now, I'll say a bit more about that because it's quite an important uh, element in the Australian scheme of things. Uh, it includes uh, economic efficiency, so that's a legislative objective for government, and it includes uh, administrative efficiency. So, right from the outset, we had those economic elements in there. Now, the Commission is responsible for day to day management of the domestic uh, fisheries. Uh, the Commissioners themselves, the legislation is quite clear about who can count the fishery. You have to have the, uh, the, the sorts of expertise you mentioned there, that resource management. Green science, business management, business management and governance. Uh, it needs some level of, bit of industry, of understanding of industry, but not allowed to be an active participant uh, in, in the industry. The CEO of AFMA, uh, so I should say that the, one of the main reasons for this is the whole structure is going to hold the day to day management at arm's length from the political processes and the processes of the government departments. And it's been very successful that it's, re it's removed the, um, uh, that, that political dimension from the day-to-day -day, uh, operations. Now the CEO of EFTA is also responsible for exercising Australia's foreign compliance uh, uh, function. <coughs> the way we've set it up is, uh, so we've got the agency itself, people who have staff that were employed there, that's the, the, the implementation agency, and the commission is essentially a decision point. which is a bit like the board, like uh, regular uh, corporate structure. Uh, EFMA, and again, it's different to, to say, for example, what's done in the US uh, and in Canada. Um, it's got extremely limited in house capacity for science and economics. And that's very intentional. Uh, we actually did not want uh, that you know, to internalize a lot of that, uh, that activity uh, and put that come with potential for you know, sanitizing the science or, or, or influencing the science or, or being captured by the science. So it's basically uh, all, all the science and the economic input is, is externally sourced by quite complex collection by using that. <coughs> now the technical um, fishery assessments are essentially done in these fishery assessment groups. These groups here. Uh, when they do their work and they provide their reports and do their, uh, their assessment, the same information, the same reports go straight to the commission. So that's seen un and adultery, and they also come via these management advisory committees. Now, the management advisory committees have got a uh, pretty strong industry involvement, so you get a, a much stronger industry overlay there. But I should emphasize that both of these groups, the management advisory committees and the fishery assessment groups, have, they've both got uh, a wide range of, of um, participation from industry, science, conservation, so the NGOs are on uh, all those groups, recreational fishing interests. They're, they're all they're all there. So uh, as you mentioned, it's a it's a, a dynamic environment, and, and so uh, uh, but the, but the good side of that is that you, you, you tend not to get surprised. Uh, the, the issues get uh, flagged and, and fleshed out, and sometimes sorted. Uh, the other thing about uh, AFMA is it's got a very strong preference uh, in policy uh, for rights-based approaches, uh, in, either input or output. So, for example, these are all around statutory fishing rights. So, uh, all our management plans are statutory management plans that get the uh, 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 authorised under the legislation through Parliament. And once the any rights set up under there, then they uh, ITDs, you know, individual transferable effort uh, controls, or ITQs, individual transferable quotas, they, they are statutory rights, quite strong rights. <coughs> again, on the, looking at the broader policy again, uh, we do have two departments, the, the government departments that are, that are, that are uh, part of this action. The Department of Agriculture, Forestry and Fisheries, that's responsible for the overall uh, uh, policy structure of legislation and for Australia's engagement internationally. Uh, now again, Australia <coughs> products of unique features of the Australian system. Uh, the department has got uh, a, 
an obligation to report annually, publicly, uh, and through the Parliament of Parliament after this performance, through an independent uh, uh, assessment process, both that's both the stock the stock performance and the economy. So both are in uh, are our sort of objectives. There's also the, the lack of mention that the, the environment department, sustainability, environment, water, population, communities. Um, now they administer a, a very powerful act in Australia, which is the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act, the EPC Act. Um, within that, we've got the usual sort of things in terms of uh, treatment of endangered protected species. Uh, but there are two other things that, uh, that are conducted through that act. Well, one is uh, the Marine Bioregional uh, bio Plan, uh, which is uh, part of our recommendations policy. And I'd actually like to talk a little bit about that because there's much fun in that about doing the issue, so I'll get myself back. Um, they, so that they are actually uh, responsible for the, uh, the application of oceans policy as it's being uh, applied around Australia, and in particular the development of the national representative system. Areas, very much biodiversity conservation oriented. And the second thing that uh, has an important uh, implication for fisheries is that uh, I think this is unique uh, worldwide uh, in that uh, all Australian fisheries uh, have, that are exported and all federally managed fisheries uh, need to be assessed uh, for their ecological sustainability by the, uh, by the environment department. In fact, to get an export permit for fish products from Australia, you actually need that, that export permit needs to be signed off by the environment as the, the source of the sustainable fishery. Those things are, are quite powerful. So the reason we're going through all of that is that essentially that, that structure provides a, a, a lot of checks and balances through the, uh, through the whole scheme. Probably more checks and balances than I've like seen a lot of other places. On top of that, yeah, Australia has actually got a very small population. Look at the population of people involved in fisheries, it's even smaller. Uh, and so you've got lots of people playing involved in the world. Um, with the, the classic, yeah, that. Um, there's also substantial career movement by people back and forth among these various places from uh, the different departments throughout the between science and policy. There's, there's more exchange there than is common, I think, in most other places. And it means that most people then end up with a pretty good understanding of some diverse perspectives. And there's a further thing that's very important in terms of uh, having been a very major driver in, in all of this, which is this business of the ecologically sustainable development. Now, uh, uh, again, this was rather unusual in Australia. That a lot of the people who came back to Australia, having participated in the 19, uh, late 70s and early, early 90s in the uh, book, uh, Congress of Environment Development, and the uh, Congress of Environment Development, basically coming back from those, this is the Rio, Agenda 21 for those things applied. Um, the, the, the folks who came back from those to Australia actually uh, took it a lot, a lot more seriously than a lot of other folks did. And uh, they, we, we ended up in uh, 1992 having this, uh, the Commonwealth of Australian Government, so that's the federal government plus all the state governments, all signed uh, this ESD, um, uh, right, uh, Environmental environment Sustainable Development. Uh, agreement uh, in 1992 uh, as the basis for all environmental management and that resource management in Australia. Now, that, that, that was actually a, quite, a, quite a crucial step, although it sat there a bit dormant for a while while people worked out what to do with But that policy, that ESD uh, agreement, the principles of it flowed, flowed through and they're, they're now actually in the law and in the legislation uh, for all of the major natural resource management and fisheries um, agencies. So what actually is it? Um, th th these are the sort of principles that were in that nature agreement. Now you can look at them nowadays and, and say, yep, yeah, that's what else would you expect. Um, but the integration of economic and environmental considerations and decision making, uh, that, 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 that binds us to the precautionary approach, that actually interestingly uh, locks in intergenerational equity, so it starts actually talking about time frames for whatever uh, this actually becomes quite important when you start to put their trade-offs and various things and talking about what's an appropriate discount rate for this and the other. Um, the uh, uh, up, uh, highlighting biodiversity conservation uh, and, uh, and uh, ecological integrity, and even though people are still grappling with what you actually do with that, and the fact that it's in there is important. And this last one, which is the use of uh, valuation pricing and incentive 
uh, was a very strong product, for example, in the early boom of Australia into the adoption of ICQ. Uh, and very much support that kind of thing. So what happened after 1992? There was a, a lot of act action put in place trying to work out what to, what to do with this, uh, within fisheries. Uh, uh, all of the different sectors had to go off and come up with their, with their plans and how, how they were going to act. Uh, within fisheries, we came up with um, the, uh, a, a plan in the late 1990s. And I've only shown you know, we basically took those high level principles and, and, and allowed them and allowed them to drop down into what was more operational. And I've only given you the top little layer here, but it went through a whole process of devising, uh, devising these headings, what was underneath there, and effectively a process that takes these all the way down to lots and lots of subcomponents, all the way down to the actual operational level. So that was a it's a structure that's still there, still being used actually. And it's very helpful when you go into a new fishery to make sure that you've got everything covered and to work your way right down from the high level down to the, uh, to the operation. <coughs> now, that, 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 having these sorts of principles and components in place has really made it much more able, made Australia much more able to actually implement a lot of these things uh, and, uh, uh, and, and, and including, as we're now bumping into cross sectoral management. Uh, it's really helpful for them, for them to talk about it here. Really helpful to have uh, those same principles uh, in the legislation, for example, that's governing agriculture and fisheries and the whole series of other things. So you, 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 when it comes time where you start to unify some of these approaches, you've got the, you've got the, the, the sort of the commonality there to work with. But we have had a lot of trouble actually operationalizing the uh, so without getting bogged down into definitions, the, the, this is sort of how I like to think of uh, our, our um, environmentally based uh, management approaches. You think of you know, sort of three three levels as a sort of the, the myopic single sector approach, which I think is where everybody's, you know, all the various single sectors start. There's a ecosystem, um, uh, single, uh, single sector ecosystem approach. Uh, and there are two, in fisheries there are two versions of that. There's the, the FAO version, the ecosystem approach to fisheries, which is paraphrase a small book. <laughs> it's basically you, you start with the fishery and you have the ecosystem considerations. Uh, the uh, the, the picket general approach to the EBFM is sort of almost the opposite. You start with the ecosystem and the services and then you see where fisheries can, can fit into that. Um, and then you've got the full integrated uh, management of the other side. Now, essentially uh, where, where we are with a lot of what we're doing, I would, I would characterize it being in, in this, mostly in this sort of space of elements of that. Uh, we've got another set of processes that are going that, that, that take that take that approach, but no, I'll, I'll cover those. <coughs> so, what were the actions that we that we uh, took during the, the 2000s while we were grappling with uh, uh, how to actually really do this? So, there were five of them basically that, that I'll, 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 I'll try and go through. Um, the uh, the uh, uh, harvest ready policy, the development of uh, risk assessment methodology, uh, the increased use of space <coughs> energy, uh, the government funded buyback uh, to restructure fleets, and a significant investment to deter illegal uh, fishing from, uh, from uh, foreign fleets. Uh, now, simultaneously, there was a whole series of things that I mentioned before about the regulation management, including the uh, so the, uh, the harvest strategy policy is essentially, you can recognize this pretty, pretty closely, harvest strategy is the monitoring plus the assessment plus the harvest control rule. Defaults are being uh, are set. Uh, the maximum sustainable yield is basically uh, a default rebuilding target, so that's uh, quite in here. Uh, um, MEY, maximum environment, uh, economic yield, is the, uh, is the operational target for both biomass and, and uh, fishing mortality. And we've got a, a limit here at about 2% of uh, the BMSY level. Uh, below that limit, there's no permitted targeted fish, target fishery, but it is listed by catch, and there's a lot uh, around that. And if you're below that, you could actually be listed under the uh, uh legislation. We also have a risk criteria uh, in terms of uh, these, these harvest strategies have to have, to, have, to have a less than 10% chance of, um, of failing. The uh, implementation of that MEY as a target raised some interesting points. Uh, we've bumped into some things, although MEY is a, is a concept that's been around a long time. We have managed, managed to find a lot of places that people are actually trying to implement it in a practical sense. Uh, it's a bit like MSY was a long time ago. 
very simple when you do is it faults, very messy when you start to try and say, well, let's put this in a, a dynamical context and, and work with that. What we're finding is uh, MEY is usually a, a good concept as well. There are dynamic versions are apparently not common and they're not standard. Um, you, you, you need to couple with ecological and economic folds with good detail on both. And, uh, if you're aware that in the world there are bioeconomic folds with lots of biology and a tiny bit of economics at the end, and a lot of bioeconomic uh, folds with tons of economics and a tiny bit of biology, but there's actually not all that many reasons where the balance is, is struck with you. It needs all these free dynamics information, cost, price of folds, um, hard to get, uncertain, no doubt uncertain. Uh, we find that the uh, optimal endpoint and the transition is, is very dependent on some on assumptions that are not well based. And we have a little bit of difficulty, we have had a little bit of difficulty because all of this can be seen by, in, by industry as simply an additional sovereign risk. All things that the government's doing to you, it's very hard for to manage. So we will persevere, I'll say that. Uh, but we realize that there's, there's no model solution that's unique and lasting, so we just have to be adaptive. And in that, we're relying a lot on our, our governance model. Uh, to have that engagement and that uh, uh, reputation um, the, We also use, uh, you know, while this harvest strategy policy is couched in terms of fishing mortality and biomass, uh, we have lots of issues where we don't estimate the fishing mortality or biomass. So we've had to develop a lot of strategies that, uh, that are different to fishing mortality and biomass strategies, that, um, uh, but that can achieve the same outcome. So they're based on all sorts of things. Uh, catch rate, size composition, etc. <coughs> and we, we need to make sure we've got these, uh, this uh, precaution built in there so that we're using uh, less robust methods that we've actually got the precaution built in there sufficiently so we do achieve the outcomes of the room. And we use this management strategy evaluation methodology a lot uh, in, in doing this. So I might actually just quickly explain that before I go on. Uh, so I think most of you here know, but for those of you who don't, Management strategy evaluation is a, is a simulation testing of a proposed harvest strategy. It's a bit like a financial stress test that they do on banks. Um, you know, is your bank liable to stand up uh, under the kind of external force and pressure that they're trying to run it? A strategy can't sustain itself, can't perform in this sort of simplified simulation testing world, and in my view, you've got just no basis for expecting it to work in the real world. Um, so the, the minimal test. Essentially what you do is you select your performance measures here, you propose actions here, you develop some models and systems, you make several of them, you simulate the, the, the dynamics, you simulate the observations, the assessment, the management, the decision making, and the implementation. So you're just basically making sure that all of that works. What you're typically trying to do is that, uh, uh, that if you take anything and try and predict it in the future, it tends to look a bit like that. Um, and, uh, uh, what you're looking for is a, a, a feedback decision rule that takes the indicators that you work with, has actions, when the indicator is too low, you have actions that will increase it, when it's too high, you have actions that decrease it, so you can turn that into that. Uh, greater greater uh, certainty in terms of the outcome. Now what we've done with that, and this is a, a bit of a long-winded example here, but here, here's an example of a, of a, a totally assess assessment-free management strategy that meets the requirements of the harvest strategy policy, but doesn't involve F or B. Uh, what it does, basically, is a, it's a, uh, the structure is a decision table, or a decision tree. Uh, it's, you're dealing with some empirical indicators, which are, in this case, both catch rates and body weights in, in the catch. You've got uh, the, catch, the catch rate of the uh, a certain weight range is categorized as one of these. You've got four different situations under each of those rising, steady, or falling, you've got a, uh, a, 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 a smallest per recruit reference point here, which is actually just telling you what the size composition should look like if you were if your fishing mortality was, was where you wanted it. And then you've got a, ch a choice of selection of, of, of uh, prescribed actions that uh, occur. <laughs> Why? There it is. Uh, so we're having a real lot of trouble getting from that last slide to this slide in practice. So uh, the, the management strategy evaluation uh, that we use, uh, here, here's just an example of some of the results there. This is the model of the unobserved population. These are the sorts of, these are the simulated indices that the uh, decisions were based on. 
Here's the basic uh, catches that catch the decision ball. The point to bear in mind is this is a very simple thing starting from, uh, starting from an fishing coming down, but you can do these simulations in all sorts of positions, you know, starting over fishing and going up. What you can demonstrate is that this type of strategy, no assessment involved, is, is really robust. It will actually lead you to the right solutions, even though you've never needed them for me. So, environmental risk assessment, that was the second thing I was going to talk about. Um, this is the response to what can we do with thousands of bike experts that there's no very little about. Uh, this is a key tool in our toolbox. Um, and we've used it to assess bycatch species, target species, uh, protected species, and habitats. <coughs> uh, it's providing a lot of uh, guidance for in terms of our, our management as well as our uh, research for our I should say that this, this is now being taken and modified and used as one of the one of the available scoring methods for the marine surgery What does it look like? Uh, basically, it's, 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 it's quite a simple concept. It means that you start off with a, with a, uh, a qualitative risk assessment. If you can show that, it's, that it's, there's no risk there, that's fine. If not, you can, you, you, know, you can put the investment in the additional work or money and, uh, and go with the second one, one, same choices there. If you find there's nothing there, there's no risk there, you can manage it that way. Or you can go down through and, and, and uh, go with a full uh, assessment. At each point, you've got the choice of staying where you are and managing appropriately, having risk management a response to that level of risk, or going to the next level, investing in the additional uh, knowledge. <coughs> because, uh, and, and to do that successfully, of course, what you need to have is the level of proportion built in adequately. So if you decide to stay here, uh, you've, you've actually got uh, a, a good assured way that it, it is really safe there, even though it's, um, uh, it's, it's assessed with a lot of evidence. Uh, so these these three levels, the, the quantitative, the qualitative, the semi-quantitative, and the uh, and the you know, qualitative. Uh, there are the sorts of uh, approaches that, that are there. So I'll just quickly go through those. The, the first level is based on you identify the activities, you identify the components, you identify the subcomponents. You then basically look at the development, uh, the, the impact scenarios. You choose the worst impact scenario on the weakest subcomponent. For that, you use a lot of stakeholder engagement with that. If that weakest one scores below the threshold, then you can assume that the rest do as well. If they score above, then you can assume that there are at least one and probably more that would score above. And that's what the results look like. So you can run this through a fishery and you can see that, for example, we'll take here the bycatch, bycatch species. None of the bycatch species in this particular fishery scored. Uh, in the in the in the uh, high high risk high the uh, area, uh, there were obviously some threatened endangered species that did. Uh, but you use that basically the result of that would be to say that for this species you've got no problems here, you've got no problems there, uh, and so you focus on these ones and these ones. So you might go to the next level, which is this uh, semi quantitative approach. Basically, it works on the idea that we're trying to get a productivity and and uh, stability. Productivity, we can we've standardized so you can actually get a, a use biological characteristics to look at where you are there. Susceptibility, and a very simple way of going through what the issues operations are, and that interacts with the, um, right, with the fish. What that looks like is like this, and again, this is one of our, one of our fisheries. Um, this is the susceptibility score, productivity score, you've got the water species that are out here, uh, and so you, 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 you can calibrate where you want to put, put these uh, boundaries, and uh, that's how we, that's how you get through a large number of species in a relatively short amount of time. You can do the same thing with habitats, and this is an example where we've actually got these different, different habitat types, and using that same methodology uh, of productivity, susceptibility, uh, you can map all these different kinds of habitat, uh, habitat types into that, into that structure, so you, you then know which ones are, are, to, uh, are at risk, and how you might want to make them you know, overall, it looks sort of like this. You, know, you start off with level one. You, you've got for some of them. You, you, there's no need to go any further. Level one, for the ones that you do have some sort of high risk, you go to level two. Of those, some of them may be be When you look at it more quantitatively, they're, they're fine. But you still have the other ones. Indeed, these kids go off into uh, a more quantitative analysis. We apply that to a lot of species uh, and a lot of fisheries and. So far, what we've seen there is that basically 
the precaution works out reasonably well. So I've taken this one, it should, it should be a 500 species considered. About 30 found to be a higher risk at, the, at one level, but when you get to, to, taken up to the level three, it's much fewer. So you can feel the, the precautions in there is working the right way. And it's institutionalized now. So what I've just described there is the assessment part. That, that's only that little tiny bit there. All of the rest here is the, the, man, the risk management framework. This, this is where the uh, FBA agency uh, takes those risks, puts them through the management advisory committee, options get determined in terms of the risk management responses. They get evaluated by the, you know, by the commission, by the board, with that loop. And then that, that's this is about a five year cycle. Uh, so that's how we put that all together. Increased spatial management. Uh, it's again been a really, really important uh, tool we can work with. Uh, it turns out to be a really cost effective way of dealing with a lot of these species uh, risk problems. You know, one closure at 12 place can actually uh, deal with uh, a lot of different risks. Um, you know, a lot of different species and rather than trying to manage each risk um, separately, uh, spatial management often uh, is just quite possible that way. Uh, <coughs> so we're actually making a lot more use of, uh, of, of spatial management. I've got a couple of examples where we were uh, uh, looking at some large-scale closures for, uh, for the to protection, to basically separate and catch the two different sharks, one of which is really productive and one of which is not. So we're using some special, yeah, a lot of spatial structure for, for dealing with that. Um, we're separating out different gear types. It's again mainly because by, by space and by depth. Again, this is because of the, the uh, bycatch impact and managing those, those risks. Um, we're dealing right now with, with how to deal with some of these very low productivity uh, of slope shark species. And the only way they're dealing with those is in fact through spatial flows as far as we can see. That's where we're actually uh, working on that. Uh, that's like, we've got some in place already. We're we'll talking finish, we'll probably have like 40% of their habitat in place. And across the top of all of that, we've got this bioregional planning process that I mentioned. So these are the, the bioregions in Australia, through here. And there's a planning process of developing the green uh, area system through that. And for example, that's what it looks like in the southeast corner. Um, the, these, are the, uh, the, these are the various green um, picked areas. They're, they're, they've got different zones. So for example, some, some are multi, some are multiple use, some of these ones, so they're just for fishing. Uh, some are total uh, protected area sanctuary zones, so those are for real mixture in. And what we're doing, our spatial management and the fishing side of things is in that so we can actually make use of some of the benefits of this. The government and buyout, uh, now that's not a, so the, the government in Australia does, is, is not a big fan of uh, government and buyout. So, uh, so this, was, this, is an, this was an unusual event. Um, uh, Australia is really strong on, on an uh, autonomous adjustment to market instruments. And, uh, and so, but it was found in several of our fisheries. And, uh, I won't dwell here on why, but anybody's interested in those cues and what they do and don't do, I think they don't talk about a lot of that. But we had a couple of fisheries where basically after many years of ITQ, ITD fisheries, um, just had to adjust. Uh, basically, uh, the, 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 there was just not enough alternatives and they were too far from the optimum to be able to take losses that they needed. To. So they were sort of stuck, nobody could actually move. A lot of, lot of discussion about the options here. One, of the, one very significant discussion that I'll, that I'll mention uh, involved um, uh, the use of, of, a, of a, uh, combined ecosystem the economic models, this is the Atlantis model framework, for those of you who know that, to actually look at some of the options and really work them through. Um, that, was, that was done with a lot of government and industry involvement. Uh, there were two basic evaluation methods. One was expert, was done in parallel, one was expert group, and the other was so we looked at five different model scenarios. So the status quo, that's uh, ITQ everything, that was for the economics folks. We really thought that, you know, we just had to try that up hard enough. Uh, another was um, uh, really uh, you know, taking a, a much more fundamental integrated approach to, to everything. Uh, the fourth one was let, let's, let's do lots of MPAs. That was, that was the environmental response to the economics, really. Uh, the what we need is. There's uh, lots, lots more and bigger in the and that can solve the problem. Uh, and then the fifth one was just, let's just, let's just tighten up on what we've got. Uh, so we use both the uh, Atlantis model here, which is a, you know, 
pretty well, a pretty thoroughly developed model with uh, the information on the to to uh, folks. And we had this, uh, this is a really interesting process, we had this parallel expert group uh, who basically sat down and we structured it just like a, a management strategy evaluation with the same performance of uh, uh, measures, the same uh, scenarios, except we were using human mind as a computer instead of the simulation. Uh, and they, they, were, they were well set in human minds too, but the interesting thing was that they came up with just so much the same uh, conclusion that was quite staggering. Um, all the discussions reached the same, reach the same point. Uh, that basically there needed to be a substantial intervention. Business as usual, even tight enough business as usual, but wasn't going to do it. Uh, ITQ and everything wasn't going to do it. MPAs everywhere wasn't going to do it, but actually needed a collection of these things, and that was what we uh, put forward. So the government actually made available uh, $203 million for a big buyout. Uh, we spent a lot of time designing that, um, and we, what we basically did was we, we spent a lot of time actually working out what the new operating environment was going to look like, making sure everybody understood that. And then people had the option to either stay, knowing what was coming, uh, or, or go. Uh, the operators had to have a tender, they had to put a sealed tender in, what they were offering, you know, what, what, way of, uh, what, what they were offering to lose, and how much they wanted for it. Uh, we had a totally independent process for value. Uh, this was another very interesting exercise, uh, but for valuing, valuing those things. And then we had two rounds of that. The second round was for those who didn't quite understand the first one. Uh, <laughs> and there were a few of those. <laughs> uh, uh, anyway, we, 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 it was a very successful exercise of talking to that. The last one I'll just touch on is the maturing legal foreign mission. We had a significant problem both in the north and the south. In the southern ocean, um, a lot of the fish fish operation in the north, uh, all, all manner of um, the fisheries coming down from the southern states. Uh, in the southern ocean, uh, several, uh, and Australia invested very heavily in this model, this is a lot of the development. Um, several very well internationally coordinated cases that ended up with a whole series of uh, very, very highly valuable vessels being actually captured uh, and, and ultimately sold, including from some nations that were really, really embarrassed, like Norway. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so um, that, that was really interesting. And, and the other thing that happened with that was uh, that the industry, got, the international industry, got together, and they formed this group called, called Colmar. Uh, and, and they which still exist, you can go and check them on, on their website, they're still very active. And they formed to use industry knowledge to find, you know, to find and trace the various companies that are involved with doing this sort of stuff and, and outing them. Um, and that, that's, that's been extremely effective. Um, so the legal vision now, that southern zone for Australia, is, is virtually, it's virtually gone, uh, which, is, which is quite amazing. The Northern Australia was quite different. Uh, real mix of boats, you know, wooden through to um, uh, steel decors. Um, many of them operating illegally in other EUs in the region, so we could actually get uh, other nations uh, on board. Uh, several years of quite intense inception and prosecution. Uh, we've had a huge reduction in, in uh, that whole operation. I'm just pointing out what. So, so when we started off, it looked a bit like this. We flew over Australia uh, to begin with. Uh, the, the, the big ones are apprehensions and the green ones are uh, sightings that we didn't apprehend. Um, by, you know, the, the, we've got kind of changes here. So from here and here and here, the green ones are simply outside and the red ones are inside. Uh, so by, by here, uh, two years later, uh, and this, by the way, is a committed zone. So that's a, that's a joint, jointly managed area between Australia and Indonesia. So those, those red ones are fine. They're inside the joint but they're legal. These ones here are not. These are, these are illegal. So that's that's a picture we managed to, 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 to change uh, through. We still get a few incursions here and there. Uh, the other thing is, I've got another photo that I've got, I was actually out of show, which I thought was, was a picture, but uh, a photo taken, taken by one of the surveillance painters going along here, just look, looking up on the other side of the line. And the, in that photo, you can see 200 petrols uh, all in, in view. Uh, and stopping right on the line, and as you see, yeah, sometimes just a chat over. But <laughs> that's the sort of situation we're given. We know we need, we need to maintain this level of effort. Should also say that the, the tactics haven't had all that subtle. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so basically, for, for about two years, we were apprehending and destroying a vessel a day. 
more than this would have. <laughs> so, where, where, where do we get with all of this? Uh, they're, the, they're the things that we did. Uh, what's been the outcome? Let's just go you know, read, read a where, where all this is playing in terms of the, the economic and the biological performance. So, the economic performance, uh, it's been remarkably effective. We removed about a third of the total fish. Uh, economic performance has really increased and improved for all of those fisheries. We've got one or two that are just slightly on the negative side. We'd like to see them on the other side, but we are now leaving it to all to just take, take uh, things from there. In terms of the number of target stocks, uh, we, we've certainly dealt with this large lump of uh, unassessed fisheries. So we've, we've managed to get uh, a lot, a lot of those unassessed fisheries down. Uh, we've had the number of, of uh, not overfished and fine fisheries gone way up. This persistently nagging level uh, flat line for here is, is, is not what we want the first thing. We've actually transferred a lot of species from there to there. Uh, but one of those, the number of species, the number of stock units that we're looking at has increased at the same time. And uh, this is the, 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 the geneticists, they keep, uh, they've now discovered how to partition things up. So we keep, every time we get on top of something rather they break it to two and, and, and one of them bad. <laughs> so, so essentially what we're left with here is, is eight, uh, eight species that we've, we've got here. Uh, four, four of those are actually internationally managed, and that's, as you all know here, that's, a, that's another whole ball map what we're doing with the um, uh, Regional Fisheries Management uh, Organization. Uh, two, two of them basically are, are, are this ongoing issue of the, of the geneticists breaking up stocks and, and then all of a sudden we're going to do a, a separate stock assessment part of the problem, and we'll get on top of that. We've got a couple that are, that are much nastier, much more difficult, that we've been trying to get on top of for a while, and they, and they really have no, no surprise. They really want to do with low productivity species and a multi-species context, and we're, we've tried all manner of things uh, to deal with that, and, and, uh, uh, and we'll continue to, uh, to get on top of that. The ecological risk, uh, we've basically done, we've done this for thousands of taxa. Uh, so um, we've, we've got 53 that we're now actively uh, on our, our high-risk list, but we're, that we're actively looking at uh, management. Uh, three months be reporting back to the Commission as to how those things are going, so we're getting to get on top of them pretty hard. Um, and then part of our reporting back to on the sustainability board for the uh, EPBC around the that's, that's providing a really major target for our both management effort and research effort. And, 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 and I, I would say it really has moved us out of that environment that we were in a few years ago where every now and again we got a massive surprise that something was that we had to get caught before suddenly turned up on the front page of all the newspapers and, and we're off again. So we're actually much more now fully cognizant of what actually we're doing and how we're moving to deal with it. Um, so the conclusions of I mean we like lots of others are, are definitely struggling with one prep ways that we go forward with the DBFM. Um, we've got a lot of species, a lot of area and limited resources made a lot of progress, but another, it's also taken a lot of focus effort to, to, uh, to, to, to do that. It's also taken a lot of engagement with, uh, with, our, with our stakeholder groups. Um, and without actually having that, uh, as, as I look back, without that kind of really um, uh, significant stakeholder engagement in the government's model, I don't think we would have gotten very far with that. Um, we've got some serious challenges to come, uh, but we will carry on with that. Um, now, now, can we do it? I mean, my view is that we, do, we can with the, the, the uh, uh, level of, 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 of scrutiny on fisheries means that we just got to get on top of this secret. Uh, I think we can actually do it, and even with the information available, we actually know a lot about the biophysical system. Um, we've got some good methods to, to make decisions, even with the data. Uh, I, I don't think that's a problem. The, the real problem is that we've got to get out of this mindset that we have to know everything about everything before we get The management system, I think, is quite crucial in that. Um, some of the various attributes of that. And the other thing that I've come away with this, from this whole journey is that you know, there is no silver bullet. You, know, you keep hearing and um, um, economists will say that this, you know, put in strong lights and oil else will, will fail. Or, or others might say that put in large numbers of EPKs and you know, oil else will follow out. Our experience, both modeling and practically, has been that that's not the case. 
that you, you end up needing a whole collection of, of, of actions. All the tools are there. Um, and, and you just need to get on with it. And, and, yeah. So, let's take a bit longer than I anticipated. <coughs> uh, but thank you.
if you have to stop target fishing, but you can actually permit um, uh, bycatch fishing. Uh, uh, so, so it's, it's, it's not mandated as strongly as it is in the US uh, about uh, some of those things. But on the other hand, what it does is it's, it's uh, and I have long discussions with people like Wayne Andre about this, and, and, and Andre knows both systems very well, he's worked on both systems very well. We, we end up, I think, finding some better balanced solutions by, um, by having more, more flexibility uh, and some of these, these processes and, uh, that allow people to actually have their say, have their say evaluated and see how it's evaluated and then if we went down a really strict and legislative uh, process. Okay. We don't have a specific um, uh, policy or anything like that to say that no, 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 thou shalt not fish a sporting <laughs> aggregation. So, uh, on the other hand, you know, we, we do know that fishing sporting aggregation, you know, fishing effectiveness can be very high. So, uh, in different circumstances, we've got closed area, you know, time areas that protect sporting aggregations, um, and, and others that affect the sporting aggregations are the target. So, uh, you know, for those, you know, they're not protecting, but we do manage that the level of effort. Yeah, quite, quite closely. Um, in terms of um, the food supply, um, I should mention mentioned that, but quite one of the, um, the, the, the a, a variation on the how it's controlled for the mentioned there is, is, a, is a limitation on how um, how hard the people can fish on uh, forage fish. And, uh, and, and basically it's, it's, uh, it's about half. You know, you do the, 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 you, you're not allowed to fish more than about what, what, what half the the rate would be if it was a non forage fish. So that's all in there, but that's a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Uh, you could actually fish them several times harder than they currently are, and they would still be within the 
in their own individual earnings wise. Um, now there are a few though that, have, that are less productive and are still caught in that, in that fishery. And they're the ones that, that, that we'll put out here. Um, interestingly, there's, 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 a, there's a large number of sharks that are involved there, and we, if we start off with the usual assumption that, that we would end up with a lot of sharks um, in that high risk category. Well, out of the lot of sharks that actually live in those waters, only two, um, because of their low productivity, turned out to be um, high risk. The, the others actually were all, were all fish. Um, and you know, that, that actually, for various life history reasons, uh, are, are low for activities. But you know, they're just, the interesting thing is that when you really go into some of these fisheries, you end up with a bit of a surprise. Um, the, the converse surprise that we had was the, uh, with the tuna long run fishery, where you know, relatively low levels of bycatch in the tuna long run fishery. So we actually went in there and well, this is one. Um, and uh, it turned out that actually it wasn't uh, because the, uh, the the species that actually are that are fish species that are bite, that are called caught as bycatch and they're, they're also top predators uh, and with, with relatively low you know, relatively low prices. So when you start to look at that, you find that there's, there's actually uh, there's actually a, there's more ecological risk in the, bite, the fish bycatch of uh, tuna long lunch than there is in a shrimp. Uh, troll fishery, even though when you look at the pile of white catch on the deck, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll actually start with the opposite. But, but, yeah. it, it's actually a really interesting thing that comes out when you really start teasing out what is the ecological risk rather than just being overwhelmed by the, by the pile of fish. Well, I'll stop that there. You can nab Mark Blitz with a, with a drink in his hand. Thanks,